More than 30 years ago, Miccosukee elders started documenting the changes to the natural environment. Today, our community has incorporated traditional techniques with modern methodologies. Our anecdotal and scientific data helps guide decisions related to Everglades restoration. The Everglades is a very large and unique ecosystem in the U.S. It's the, there's a term of this, the only one Everglades, and it's true, there is the only one Everglades. Within the United States, it's the largest wetland, continuous wetland and flowing river. It starts at Orlando area, Kissimmee River. The river comes down into Lake Okeechobee, and it comes down all the way into the bay, through the Everglades, all the way into the bay. But it, but it was a big old river coming down, because there's hills, it's high up there. So it just flowed all the way into the, uh, to the bay, but that don't exist no more. Because the Everglades, it goes all the way from Naples all the way to Miami. Just getting smaller and smaller every day, the development. So long ago, creation surely will. For we are one with every living thing, from the greatest to the small. I started working in the Everglades as a young biologist, and I started studying my classical training as a biologist and ecologist. I knew right away I wanted to work in the Everglades. It's an amazing place, and it's a national treasure. Here in Florida, I frequently take people from the urban environments directly into the Everglades, and I do that not only through my profession, I do it recreationally as well, because there's so much to see. And you think of the Everglades, you have a a classic mind picture of this river of, river of grass and the open sawgrass strands. But the Everglades is so much more than that. It's tree islands. It's up story, upper story habitats inhabited by birds and bird rookeries. It's gator holes and gators. It's a flood control system. It provides excellent ecosystem services for the urban and built environment, as we like to call it in Everglades restoration. The built environment would be the urban community surrounding the Everglades. The Everglades provides flood protection for those communities. It provides storage of freshwater resources for those communities. It provides groundwater recharge, the ability of surface waters to move down into the well water system and recharge the wells and aquifers. That's, a very, that's very important for maintaining fresh drinking water resources and maintaining agricultural resources in Florida. All of these services are extremely important. Since the Everglades study was initiated 30 years ago, there's been a number of dramatic changes in the Everglades. Things like water management, things like nutrients in the water and pollution coming from agricultural and anthropogenic sources have impacted the Everglades. Water volumes in particular within the last decade have, been, have forced a very dramatic change. Over the last decade, there's been an increased quantity of water stored in Water Conservation Area 3 and that has greatly affected the use of the islands and the community members and the interaction with the islands. For instance, this year on the Everglades study, the maximum water depths were 44 inches throughout the region. That's too deep for many wildlife in the area, and many of the islands themselves were flooded and would be unavail unavailable for tribal agricultural, tribal use. And one thing that was noted in earlier studies was a very common occurrence of wildlife. Things like river otters, bobcats, raccoons. These things were noted on many of the islands throughout the studies 20 and 30 years ago. Today, throughout the entire week of the Everglades study, in this year's study, we only saw several wildlife species. We saw one deer, and we saw three occurrences of, a snail, of the Everglades snail kite, which is an endangered bird. Again, in the historical records, in the studies from 20 and 30 years ago, the occurrence of the snail kite was a common occurrence noted on nearly every island throughout the Everglades. As it is today, the Everglades is dying, it's not, it's not getting better, but your animals, your deers, your raccoons, your rabbits, uh, they're all disappearing. Like I would be standing right now, they'd be like a, you should see snakes at the corner, water snakes, water moccasins, but they don't exist no more, or corn snakes, or Rat snakes, they don't exist no more. 
When I was a boy, I would run around and play. I would stop. I would see, I would look down, there'd be a snake wrapped around my leg, grass snake. I would scream and holler and throw that thing away. But I, I don't, I no longer see snakes anymore. And there's too much mercury in the water. You can't eat the fish or the birds anymore. Even the animals, because the animals got to eat the fish and they got to eat the, they got to drink the grass and eat the roots and there's too much mercury. It's just gonna, it's a chain. And that's one of the reasons why that, and plus the animals you can't eat and the fish you can't eat no more. Our way of life exists and doesn't exist anymore for us in the Everglades. So what we're doing is we're just trying to make sure, try to save you know, whatever we can, as much as we can. South Florida depends on the Florida Everglades as a source of fresh water, and the Everglades is dying. Let's take a look at what the Miccosukee tribe is doing to help save the Everglades. That's our way of life. We're told to never ever leave the Everglades because this is how we survived from the soldiers back in the 18th. When Andrew Jackson signed a treaty saying, move all the Indians to Oklahoma. My, my elder people said, hey, our creator said, we he provide a refuge for us in the Everglades. You would think. You would have in a big step of swamp where nobody can see it. We were told to come into the Everglades. An island appeared. My ancestors went into that island. As long as we're in that island, nobody could see us. And they, they said that they could see the soldiers uh, driving by with their horses and with their rifles and cannons and dogs. But as long as we're in, in that in a sacred island, they couldn't see us. The soldiers. That's, why, they, that's why we're told never ever leave the Everglades. You leave the Everglades, your language, your culture, everything will die. You assimilate, you go into Miami or Naples, buy a house, live like the outside world, then your children wouldn't want to know who they are. It's but your it, homeland here. But, but as long as we're here, our Creator, His hand is upon us. That's why we're still fighting for our home and for our land. That's why we're still fighting millions to preserve the Everglades, to clean the water. And that's why I'm here. High water has had very significant effects in the Everglades. High water has affected the ability of the Miccosukee people to have native farming and native agriculture on the tree islands. It's had a very detrimental effect with the loss of tree islands. Many tree island species, large woody species and plants have passed and are no longer existing on the tree island, on tree islands. The tree islands, the, the large woody species require oxygenate, oxygen in the root zone. And to get that oxygen in the root zone, you need soil exposed to air, not water for these for the large plants. So when the tree islands flooded, 90 days has been determined to be a key indication for what they sit, how they stand currently. Traditional ecological knowledge and what the tree islands looked like years ago tell us that 90 days is too much, because at 90 days, those woody species, those large trees that built up the core of these tree islands, have passed. When their roots die and the roots begin to oxidize and rot, the tree island loses, loses actual elevation. Meaning that the soil to the rock is five feet deep on a tree island. When, it, when the large trees die, the soil compresses. And that brings the total elevation of the tree island lower. So the deeper water has a compounding effect. Everglades is a home for tribal members. They, they've been born there. They've been living there, they've been going to school, they're going to the town to, to do shopping, but they, this is their home. So any type of um, events that's really happening in Everglades, for us, it's, we call Everglades, for them, it's own backyard. So if you're having a high water event, it's like flooding your own house. So of course, they, they're very attached to and, and they're very considered about everything what is going on in the Everglades now. Today as we speak, the water at the site we're at is up to 33 inches deep, right here. And we started nine miles north of this site this morning. When we started nine miles north, the water was 25 inches deep. 25 is deep, but it's a, it's a, it's a level in which the animals can start to deal with. It's a extreme high water level. 35 and 36 that is a very high water level, very difficult for any of the animals to deal with. It's about 36 inches. Where we need maybe about two foot is about the, the right amount of water we need 
too high. When it's 36 cents, all your tree islands are all un underwater now. So you step around, you you're gonna see some spots that are dry, but it will still be muddy. It's too high, too high. And so is that when the levees come into play to alleviate yes, some yeah, of that, that, some of that? Yes, that has a lot to do with it. If it was a free flow, like back in the old days, like said, the, water, the, the water would be what, maybe a foot or under a foot. And some sections would be dry. Because when it, when it was natural, back in the old before they built the highways and the levees and the canals and everything, there were, there were always spots that were dry and there were always spots that were, had water. But during the rainy season, then you would have more water, plenty of water. But, 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 it, it, but it was a natural flow. Uh, tribal members inspire me that they never give up. They always standing up and they fight for that mother which is Everglades for them. Besides um, the meetings and politics, they always uh, they speak up for those that they don't have a voice. They speak up for the ecosystem and they trying to keep as natural as may be. They trying to protect from the uh, city from the urbanization, from the impacts with the construction. But they inspire me because they never give up and they always gonna fight for, for Everglades. Yes, our young people are realizing that the Everglades is very important, but we're the ones that, when we're out here like this, we're teaching them by, by our walk and the way we live our life. They actually speak louder than words, like to say, that's what we're doing. And they're seeing us and they're thinking, when they grow up, they're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, what we're doing now is a positive example for our children's future.